<laughs> All right, good morning. Um, okay, let's start. So these are the, the contents of the presentation. We are going to give an introduction to Zyberg, which is something that I am going to introduce now to explain what it is. Um, the motivation that I had to work on, on this project, um, we are going to see how did uh, Rails autoloaded before Zyberg, because Zyberg is the, the base of the new autoloading by default in Rails 6. Uh, we call the other one classic, uh, the classic uh, mode, all right, of autoloading. Then, how does Zyberg autoload, which is the, com the comparison why they work differently. And finally, a few words about the integration in Rails 6. All right, so Zyberg provides these features, uh, autoloading, uh, eager loading, reloading of code, all right, so autoloading is, if you've done any Rails, you know that you do not write requires, okay? The user class is just available. It's autoloaded from the user v file uh, by default in development mode, for instance, right? Eager loading means uh, loading everything up front when you boot, and reloading is the feature when you change a file, uh, something is monitoring that and reloads the code, okay? It's important to, to highlight that uh, Zyberg is, is known as the, the, the new autoloading um, you know, uh, base for Rails 6, but uh, it's indeed a, an, an independent gem. It's separated from Rails. So Zyberg is a, a separate gem that has no dependencies. And Rails uses Zyberg to uh, provide the feature, all right? But, uh, it is designed for, to be used for any Ruby project. So any gem can autoload code. Uh, other web frameworks can use Zyberg to provide autoloading, reloading, eager loading, all right? Uh, so just a, a, a simple gem with no dependencies. Okay. Let's just start uh, seeing how do you use this uh, independently without Rails, okay? Rails, so this has an API for, uh, to, to use the, the library, but in Rails, you do not use this API because the Rails integration is the one that uses the API for you. So you, in, in Rails, you are still say config cache classes equals true or whatever, you know? And then there's code that translates the Rails API into the Zyberg API, okay? So a project using Cyberg has to, has to have a conventional uh, structure just like you normally have in Rails applications. The, the, the structure is one that respects uh, this map. So file names should match constant paths, okay? Let's see some examples. For instance, user.rb, uh, it's expected to implement the user class, for instance, right? user underscore profile <clears throat> uh, is expected to define user profile caramelized, right? Like that. HTML underscore parser, by default in Zyberg like it is, uh, is expected to um, implement HTML parser with lowercase in the, in the, in, uh, the TML is lowercase. This can be changed, okay? So in Rails, you can define an, inf uh, an acronym in the inflectors, in the initializers, and it's in rail in, in, uh, Rails configures Zyberg to use active support camelized to do this translation, okay? Zyberg independently ships with a super, super simple camelizer that is deterministic. It has no configuration uh, and it's independent of the uh, um, inflector of any other possible gem or library or Rails application that is using also Zyber, because Zyber can be used by many projects. You can have a Rails application whose dependencies are using Zyber, but its, dependent, its um, dependency has its own isolate um, inflector, and uh, there's no way to influence those ones. The, the configurations are, or 
the, the logic is uh, local to your project. You have total control about that inflection, unless you use active support Camelize, which is not recommended because uh, you could ship your gem and then other people could uh, influence the inflections in active support Camelize, which is something that you do not want because you, have, you want to have control over your gem uh, no matter where it's shipped, okay? So, the inflector in each uh, project managed by Zyberg is independent of any other inflector that may, have, that may be running uh, in, the, in the same process. Okay, namespaces, okay? Uh, well, namespace is not a, like a formal concept in Ruby, but since we have this convention of file names and, and uh, file and constant paths and that kind of thing, we, we know what we mean in practice, okay, in, in this context. So, uh, these are what I call explicit namespaces. So, you have hotel.rb that defines hotel, but then you have a hotel directory, okay, that's the convention that we've used in Rails since forever. The hotel directory uh, has a, a, a constant within which is pricing, hotel pricing, okay? That's the way you have namespaces. I call it explicit because the, the parent namespace hotel is defined in its own file. But we also have implicit namespaces, which is something that has existed in Rails since forever, which is that if you have a namespace that doesn't have code, uh, you do not need to write, for in this example, we have admin role, right? So you do not need to write admin.rb. It just, uh, uh, classically, Rails has uh, created just a dummy module, dummy in the sense that it has no code, let's say, but it has the, the, the name that it has to have, right? So uh, if you put a directory and no matching admin.rb, that is going, that we call that implicit namespace, and Zyberg is going to create a, model, a, a module for you. This is the basic API. You instant, instantiate a loader, then you say which are the root di directories where, from where you want to autoload. In the case of Rails, app models, app controllers, you know, the autoload paths we, we call in, 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 in Rails. Um, you, you set them. In the case of Rails, you do not have to do that. The integration does it for you. But in the isolate uh, you know, usage of the library, you just say, okay, I want to autoload from these files, or I want to eager load from these files, and you call setup, and that's it. You are ready. With, this, with, with these three lines, you are ready to, um, to um, autoload, eager load, or whatever you want to, to have. In the case of gems, there's, there's a shortcut, because gems uh, or progress, uh, projects that have this structure of gems, they do not need to be uh, gems, um, you know, um, with a gem spec of everything. But um, the typical project that has a lib directory where you have this structure, even if it doesn't have a gem spec, uh, can work with 4gem. 4gem sets as root, root directory a lib and has a special inflection rule for version because version.rb in a gem normally is, is everything is, is, is in capital letters, okay? So you have my gem, colon, colon, version, everything in capital letters. So there's a special inflection rule that says, inflection rule for your inflection, that says um, if you get version.rb, please inflect that not just with a capital V, but everything in capital letters. Um, this is the API for eager loading. Uh, the, the, first, the first one is the, the instance method, but there's a, there's a global way to, to eager load everything. And this one is thought for services like Rails applications, where in production <clears throat> you normally want to, to load into the virtual machine as much as possible on boot, okay? Normally, by default, in production mode, you eager load the application, right? So, thanks to this, if you have other seven libraries using Zyberg in your, uh, that, uh, as dependencies of your Rails application, that, that method broadcasts the call to all the instances because Zyberg keeps a register of the 
loaders that, that, uh, that exist. So uh, this is done by the race integration, okay? So uh, you not only eager load the race application, but it is going to be better. It's going to eager load everything that is managed by Zyberg. So you have even more code loaded up front. Then if you want to reload, you have to enable reloading, okay? Um, if there are many use cases where you do not want to reload. For instance, if you are developing a gem, uh, you edit the code, there's nothing to reload, there's no server running, you know, in a typical library. You edit the code, you run the suite, that's it. So no, no, there's no use case for uh, reloading in a gem or a project that doesn't run a service. And even if you run a service, uh, typically you want to eager load when you are doing, you, when you are, for instance, in Rails in, develop, in, in development mode. You do not need reloading in the rest of the modes, typically. Okay, so reloading is, in, in that sense, like a, a small use case from the range of use cases of, of Zyber. And to acknowledge that, you have to opt in, because if you do not opt in, Zyber is able to save memory, because to enable reloading, you have to keep some metadata. But if you are not going to reload, we can save this. It can be more performant, um, especially in memory. It's not a big deal. I mean, if you enable reloading, that's, that's what you have, you have done in classic mode, uh, you know, all the time, okay? It's no big deal. But we can be more performant even uh, um, with, this, with this little tweak, okay? Performance has been like a, a fundamental goal for writing this library. Okay, the motivation for working on, on this project uh, is this. It's in reverse order. So the, the first thing that I wanted to address was to improve Rails autoloading. Because Rails autoloading, auto uh, we are going to see why, uh, has gotchas. I, if you have written Rails applications, I'm sure that you have found that edge case where you don't know, even it's, it's complicated to understand why it is not loading or not finding the constant that I want. Uh, uh, it's, it has helped us a lot during these years because we, we have not needed to write requires and, you know, but uh, it has, it has it, it, its issues, okay? So I wanted to solve this. But while I was working on this, and I started working within the Rails code base working on, uh, on this, okay? But then I realized I could solve and other problems that, or other pain points of mine, at least, um, uh, that are the following, going from, from bottom to top. Dryness, if you are used to write projects with a standard structure where file names match constant paths, which is a very common practice, then you may feel, at least I felt, uh, that you are repeating yourself in the sense that uh, you, you have the user constant, I have to, to write require user. I have hotel price, I have to say uh, require hotel price. Okay, it, and it, it's like, oh, come on, I, I'm writing the same thing all the time, you know, in the entire project. If the project is two files, no big deal. If the project is 200 files, uh, that, that starts to hurt, okay? So this is a uh, second one, uh, um, pain point. The third one, is a practical one. We are going to see that uh, probably you know requires in a in a in a Ruby project that is not a Rails application uh, a, a brittle a brittle. For instance, we have here class airplane that includes locatable. Okay, in a in a Ruby project, this won't work because you need you need a require. You, you have to require that module to be able to have it available in that in that part of the code. Okay, well, the problem is that require has a global side effect. So this could work without the require. And, I, and I'm sure that you have found this. Because if some other code before you required locatable, the constant is available here. So you do not notice, or maybe you notice in production when you have a different code path, and it breaks. So I can tell you that I have spent many, many, many hours grabbing the Rails code base uh, looking for missing requires. 
For instance, traditionally, it was painful to get the blanks right. Okay, Rails uses blank inside the code base in many places. So if you, have, if you want to have it right, you have to put blank require, blah, 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 blah blank, uh, where you are using blank, up to a point that, in the end, I gave up. After days doing th this kind of things, you know, uh, spread over the time, uh, I gave up. And we created like a core set of things that, you, that all components require, and that's it. So all components have blank. All components have the precautions, you know? And, but, well, those are like a small set. You still have this problem for the rest of the code base. This is Nano C. Nano C is a, is a static side uh, generator. Okay? Instead of cherry picking requires in every file that uses something, Nano C uh, had this list of requires in the main entry point of the, of the, of the library. Okay? This is like kind of eager loading. Okay? When you load Nano C, it loads this. Well, I mean, there's, there's, Nano C is a split when you load this component. Um, you, you load everything up front, okay? This has a cost. This has a cost. At least you are not cherry picking. You know that everything is being out, uh, eager loaded here. But uh, no, you have to remember to maintain this, okay? So it's like a trade-off. It's a compromise. But it's not like a definitive solution because if you add a file, then you need to remember to add it here. If you remove a file, you need to uh, remember to remove it from here. And also, this list has to be ordered. You cannot put just the file you know, some, somewhere. You, you, you need to put the file before code that uses your file, at least at the top level. Okay? So it has to be ordered. This is tricky. So Nano C, uh, after I released uh, Zyberg, uh, I started using Zyberg. So I, all of this is delete. You just instantiate Zyberg, uh, autoload from lib, done. So that's the idea, that, that you can streamline your programming knowing that all, all your classes are available everywhere. They are available. You use user, is you. If it's loaded, fine. If it's not, it's going to find it, load it, continue, right? OK, now we are going to, to um, see how Rails autoloaded, but for doing that, we need first to uh, have a, 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 you know, a brief const constant refresher, because this is technically all about constants. You know constants, uh, no mystery, x equals 1. But the thing is that in, in Ruby, they are like, like a super rich topic. So this is a constant assignment, you know, and this is also constant assignment, okay? So uh, we think we are creating a class, yes. But technically what is happening here is that Ruby is creating a class object and is storing the class object in the C constant. So C is not notation for classes. C is like, is a constant which is the same thing as, as this X. There's no difference, it's just a constant. X is holding an integer, and here C is holding a class object. So it's basically the same thing as this. Okay, there are uh, if you pass here a block, there are all the small differences, but not differences related to this particular talk. So this thing, except for the scoping and stuff that doesn't matter for for this presentation, is the same thing as this is creating a class object, storing the object in C, the C constant. So when we talk about the string class, and we, and we write it like a string, okay? We write it like that way. That's, formally, that's an abuse of language. Because a string is not syntax for the string class. A string is a constant. And indeed, you can launch the editor, uh, sorry, launch the virtual machine and delete that constant. You can store the string class in a different constant. You can store the, the string class in a different variable. If you delete a string, probably the, the thing is going to, to uh, err uh, very quickly, okay? Because it's going to be used by internally, whatever you know. But it, it, this is very important in Ruby to know. That is not notation 
for a class or module object. It's just a storage. And those classes can live in other places. The same object that is being held by C can be stored in a different constant, can be stored in a variable or whatever you want. So here we have user.new, OK? And we think classes. But technically, this is the user constant that evaluates to a class object that responds to new. And the result of that method call we store in a user variable. OK? In the second one, same thing, date. It's a built-in thing, yes, but not a special at all. Date is just a constant that stores a class object that has been created when you require the date library, whatever, responds to today, returns something, OK? Constants belong to modules. So modules have in internally something like a symbol table, let's say, that maps the name of the constant to the value. Like, like they have like a hash table, let's say. So this is, this is literally like this. Modules have this internal structure holding the constants that, that, they, uh, that they store, which is the, the, the way that we think of name spaces. But if you, if you stretch this metaphor, it breaks. So uh, the, 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 the thing that works is modules store constants. The values can be shared in other constants. So if you stretch the metaphor, it doesn't work. But that's the idea. So for instance, here, we are defining class hotel. Let's, let's imagine we are defining it, it here, because otherwise you can be also reopening. Okay. So class hotel is defining the hotel constant. And module pricing is, is nested, is storing pricing in the symbol table in the, in, the, in, the, in the constants collection of the class that is stored in the hotel constant. Okay. So it's the class object the one that has this collection. The constant, you can delete that thing, and the class object could still be alive, and it could still, still have pricing inside. OK. Here we have an alternative way to doing this. Uh, if you use this syntax, hotel has to be defined at that point, and pricing uh, is, is being defined or reopened within the class object stored in the hotel constant. OK. We are going now to see the concept of nesting uh, very rapidly, OK? Uh, this, I mean, you, you can give a, an entire talk only on constants. So this is just a, a, a brief thing, OK? So nesting is <clears throat> in any, at any given point in your source code, there's something that the virtual machine maintains internally, call it nesting. So in that case, uh, within hotel pricing, the nesting you have to look upwards, I mean outwards, OK? So hotel pricing is the first thing that you find, OK? And then hotel, OK? So the class and module keywords push their module and class objects to this internal collection. You can inspect it. There's API to inspect it, but otherwise it's internal, OK? Um, uh, it's important to understand that you, pu you push the class and module objects you, you see it printed with the, with the constant names, which is normally what you have, but you can break this totally, OK? So it's the objects that belong to the nesting. Forget about the constants, objects, OK? Then in the second one, the nesting is different, OK? So in the, in, the, in the second one, there's only one module keyword, right? So you push that module, and that's it. So hotel does not belong to the nesting, and this is important for constant resolution, all right? That's the difference, OK? The, 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 other key and the other key concept here is ancestors. So you know, you know the ancestor chain upwards that you use for uh, method dispatch, for instance, you know, this concept, okay? In this case, a string is an example, comparable object kernel, a basic object, okay? So we have these pieces, we can now uh, refresh how constants are resolved. So we have uh, two main cases. There, there are some other small cases, but we are going to focus on the main ones, which is a relative constant. In the example ERB, you have ERB, or you have user, you know, uh, without further cl uh, clarification. You get, you are in a certain point. You go the nesting outwards, so module, class, whatever, you know, indentation outwards, looking for, the, for that constant in those modular class objects. If you do not find it, then you go the ancestors up, OK? There's a technicality here that if you are in a module 
object does not belong to ancestors of modules, but it is checked by hand, let's say. And if you don't find it, then you get cons missing. Um, then qualified constants. In rack request, rack is relative, and it's uh, resolved with the previous algorithm. But request is qualified, let's say. Let's use that word. Request. So this is easier, OK? You just check the ancestors of rack upwards. Since 2.5, uh, two you skip object if, if you have it in the ancestor chain, which is not necessary, but uh, normally you have it. Otherwise, you fall back to cons missing. OK. So now we have the, the basics to understand how um, Rails autoloaded before Rails 6. You have this concept of autoload paths, so APP models, APP controllers, APP helpers, whatever. OK? So Rails installed a, a hook for cons missing, a global hook. So if, if you are in user's controller and you refer to the user constant for the first time, to the user class for the first time, uh, it is it is looking in the nesting, not found. It's looking in the ancestors, not found. So you go and call cons missing, okay? And the the hook that Rails installs is call it. That hook basically goes to the autoload paths and say, do you have user B? Do you have user B? Do you have it? Yes. Load that file. Uh, continue. Okay. That's that's the basic idea. Then dependency survey has a few hundred lines of code. But the basic idea is that one. All right. This has fundamental limitations. And that's why that, that, that uh, way of doing this uh, has gouges. The nesting, when, when code is missing is called, the nesting is unknown. You only, you only know the name of the constant that was missed, and you know who are you, the module where this was, class or module where this was not found. But which was the nesting at that point? You do not know it. You do not know it. You do not know if the constant was relative or qualified. And as we saw, these are like fundamental pieces of, of information that you need to have to resolve the constant, as Ruby does. So uh, active support just couldn't resolve things the way Ruby does because it lacked fundamental information. It, it did the best that it could with the information that it had. But it was missing, fundamental pieces of information were missing. So uh, it, was, it was not a perfect solution. It couldn't be a perfect solution. Then another thing, even if you had this information, even if you had this information, then the third point is still applied, which is that cons missing in this algorithm is like the last step. And we are going to explain with an example why is this an issue. Finally, that's not thread safe. Rails has some locks for main uh, paths of execution. But uh, this is fundamentally not thread safe. OK. Why is cons missing a problem being the last step? Because let's imagine this example. You have uh, hotel include pricing. The idea is that you want to include the code related to pricing in hotel, the most specific one, the second one. OK, you have hotel colon colon pricing defined, so, defined somewhere. And your intention is to load the most specific one. But what happens if you have a, a, a pricing constant in the top level, like the, the third one, and the code path, when you reach hotel include pricing, didn't pass through hotel pricing, but did pass by pricing and read. The thing is that Ruby is able to resolve pricing to the third one. So cons missing is not even call it. It's not even call it. Ruby can resolve the constant. So don't. Okay, so you are not going to autoload uh, the one that you want. Okay, so everything fixed. Okay, how does it work? We the 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 new technique is based on module autoload, which is something built in in Ruby. Okay, so that uh, in, when you are in a module or a class or module, you can define autoload uh, symbol or string with the name of the constant and the file that you want to um, load when that constant is missing. That's built in in the, in the virtual machine, OK? So Ruby does the autoload for you. So the idea is we have the autoload paths, APV models, APV controllers, et cetera, and you have the module autoload. 
So the idea is, when you start, you go to app models and you say, there's user.lb. That should define user class. And we set in object, which is the top level namespace, an auto load that says, when you refer to user, please load this file. That's the basic idea. And this works amazingly well because when I, when I explain it, the algorithms, I skip it one step, which is that every time Ruby checks if a constant belongs to some of the modules, you know, nesting, ancestors, there's a, there's a step that says, you, don't, you do not have it, okay. Do you have an autoload for these constants? If the answer is yes, it's executed. So module autoload, uh, this functionality is built in in the virtual machine and in such a way that resolves the thing when you want it. There's no difference between having it loaded already or autoloading, uh, deferred, okay? That's why this was like, uh, I had this, this solution in mind for a few years. I knew that if we could do it with autoload, solved. But there were some problems, technical difficulties, because uh, it uses require internally, but in development mode you want to load, because you want to be able to reload, but require is it impotent. So there's no way to change that. There is no API to remove autoloads. Does not support namespaces. In object, you cannot say, uh, please autoload admin colon colon role and load this file in this sub subdirectory. You have to have the admin module object. So object is able to autoload admin, one level. And then when you have admin, you can put an autoload for the children. But you cannot do that in one pass. And there's an interesting chicken and egg problem in a, with explicit namespaces that we are going to see now. OK, so everything is solved. OK, let's see how. Uh, require user, it impotent, right? So how does require know that a uh, user has been already loaded? Because there's a global collection called loaded features that has the file. If the file is present, it was already loaded. It doesn't check anything. So the collection is mutable. And if you remove this uh, string from the collection, it works. OK, so this is a little hack. And there are a few hacks, but they are like this level of hackiness. So it's not, not crazy, just small tweaks to be able to work around these deep technical difficulties. Uh, then there's no API to remove autoloads, but it turns out that if you remove const, which is, uh, belongs to the API to dynamically uh, uh, manage constants in modules and class objects, uh, effectively that removes the autoload, so solve it as well. Then, for namespaces, if we, for implicit namespaces, if we see an admin directory, we do a little, another little hack, which is that we set an autoload for a directory, okay? This is a hack because autoloads are for loading files. We set an autoload for a directory, okay? And then we have a very small, thin wrapper around kernel require, okay, that we, we, we register. We are interested in this directory. If kernel require, which is what autoload is going to fire, uh, is getting one of these directories, then we, we do not call soup, we do not call the original require. We know that we have to define a dummy module, and then we go to the subdirectory or subdirectories because the namespace can be spread in different autoload paths, and then put, uh, we, we, then we have the module, we constructed it. So we have the module, we can set the autoload paths in that module. Finally, this was the last, the last blocker, explicit namespaces. Basically, uh, you cannot load any of these files. If you load the first one, you need pricing. You cannot. If you want to load the first, the second one, because you say, okay, let's, let's have practice uh, uh, pricing. You cannot because you need hotel. So this, this was the last blocker. And I didn't solve this one. I copied this from a gem from Shopify. The idea here is to use TracePoint. So TracePoint uh, for the class event. So when the, the, when the, the hotel class, which is the top one, is loaded, just in the next line after the class keyword, before the include, we are called. 
Okay, and we have the class object, so we can put auto loads on that. So we intercept that, put auto loads, continue. So when include pricing happens, it's already set. Okay. So to finish the presentation, uh, the integration with Rails 6 is enabled by default uh, in Rails 6. Uh, so if you have low default 6.0, uh, uh, you are using uh, Zyberg, okay, for behind the scenes, okay? That's, that's a list in, in MRI, okay? JRuby, uh, it's almost there supporting, supporting Zyberg. Uh, one, one percent, uh, one percent of work is, is missing, I am told. But, but they are working on that. They eventually uh, get there. OK. Uh, good news, required dependency, gone. It's not, no longer needed. OK, required dependency was something to work around gotchas to, to say, OK, I want to make sure this is loaded at this point in a way that is compatible with constant autoloading. OK? No longer needed. You can remove them. So if you are upgrading from Rails 5 or Rails whatever to Rails 6, uh, generally speaking, you can remove the required dependencies. Uh, it could be that you need to add some acronym or something like that because uh, classic and Zyberg mode go the other way around. So classic mode receives a constant which is missing and goes to the file system. That's underscore, okay? While Zyberg goes the other way around. Zyberg receives uh, visits the file system and sets autoload. So it has to infer the constant uh, name. That's camelize. And camelize and underscore are not inverse of each other. Okay? So it could be the case that you need to put some inflection. Indeed, you can even define, forget about active support, and define a totally controlled inflector for autoloading if you want. There's the API for doing that. Okay? So you have the fully deterministic uh, thing that doesn't influence anything else in the code base. You can do that. There's a checker if you are upgrading uh, to say to check whether my project is is uh, using the conventions for uh, for this new mode, which normally is the case. Maybe you have to tweak a little bit. Depends on the size of the project and depends on the practice of the project. But generally, you are mostly good because it's basically the same conventions that we have had since forever. Then a little optimization. Uh, Zyberg only uses exclusively uh, full paths behind the scenes. There's no relative path. There's no walking directories or anything like that, except for setting setting things up. But but when you when when uh, you you when it, it, it walks one one time the the tree, it sets autoload with absolute paths. So there's no lookup, and technically you do not even need to have these things in load path. So for instance, in Rails, APP models is in the load path. That means that, that requires are going to visit you know, that thing. And you know that that slows things down. So you can, you can tweak this with this new flag in Rails 6 to remove uh, those, those directories because they are not needed for autoloading or eager loading. And finally, you can also opt out. If, if you are doing a, a, an upgrade, and um, maybe there's a lot of things to do, you can say, okay, we are going to work in autoloading later, okay? So you can say the autoloader is going to be classic, and that's, that works like it has worked uh, uh, before, all right? Uh, then you can work on other parts of the system, and eventually, if you want, you can, um, you can um, um, switch to Zyberg, which is recommended because, in principle, if everything works, as we as we want, uh, classic eventually is going to be defaced. Okay, because this is, this is a better approach. There's a uh, the upgrade guide also um, has more information about little eight cases that you could encounter. They are documented there, at least the ones that that we know. And there's a new autoloading guide. So we have the the classic guide, and now we have the new guide with all the information about this new thing. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the speech. And uh, now let's ask uh, a couple of questions. <laughs> hey, Javier. Thanks for the talk. 
Um, just a quick question. How does um, reloading work? Because you showed something with pop, but that's not reloading, right? I mean, re reloading a constant. Yeah, it is related. So we, we, we mutate loaded features because, auto, because module autoload uses require. So if you do not mutate load features, that require is going to be then potent. And when you want to reload, it's, going, it's not going to execute the autoload. OK? So that, that's one part, of the, one part of, the, of the problem, getting the require to be executed twice. OK? Because in classic mode, Rails uses load. Load is uh, always loads. OK? In the, in, so if you are in development mode by default, it uses load. If you are not going to reload, it uses require. Okay, but Zybeck is not able to, to have the option because there's no API to say to autoload, please use load instead of require, right? There's no API. So the workaround is to mutate load, loaded features so that the, you can require twice. That's part of the equation. The other part is that in Ruby, uh, when we say reloading, that's an easy way that we understand to, to, to refer to what we do and we experiment with rates. But technically, the, the VM has no API or, API or nothing to actually reload code, okay? like properly. Yeah. But the, 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 since we are in a constrained scenario in which we have this convention about paths, we are not in a generic Ruby project. We are in a generic project that has some constraints. We can exploit these constraints to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, in a way that makes that removing the constants gives you the illusion of uh, reloading. Because if you remove, let's say, hotel, you change hotel, OK? Uh, how do you remove uh, there, There's constant? API for doing that. Like Remo un undef const or something? Or yeah, what? remove const. Ah, okay. So the thing is, hotel. In, a, in, a, in, an, in an arbitrary Ruby project, you could have the, the hotel class object in a, in, a, in a hundred places, okay? So this technique doesn't work, like, like the concept of reloading doesn't work, or I, I do not know how to, define, how to define that in a generic arbitrary Ruby project. But in a project managed by this, since the, since the library and Rails put constraints on your project, you can exploit that these constraints are in place to do this metaphor. If you remove const hotel, since hotel is not going to be stored anywhere else, hotel is going to be garbage collected. That's one thing, eventually. So the code is unloaded in, in a certain way. The, the, other, the, other, the other aspect of this is that since the constant is not present, when, when the next, let's say, the next request in a range application is going to happen, the constant is missing again. So the autoload is going to be executed. Ah. All right? So two pieces. Mm. It's going to be executed again because we m mutated loaded features and then be and because we removed the constant. Uh, so that's the way it's implemented. And in Rails, you automatically undefine all constants between requests. So how does it work? In the exactly. Development? So you, you, when, when you autoload a constant, you, you keep track of that. And that what, what one, that's the memory that we save if we do not enable reloading in Zyber. By, by default, it's not enabled. You have to opt in. OK? okay? Because, because gems do not need to reload in general. OK? So um, um, yes, so you, you keep some metadata. And you, you remember which files were loaded and which constants were loaded. Indeed, there's API to say, was this constant autoloaded? OK? So, um, you keep metadata. So when you want to reload, in the case of Rails, there's a file watcher or something that says, hey, we have to reload. So that, uh, that code calls Zyberg. Okay? Zyberg does not have a file watcher. Yeah. It only has API. Okay? And, and in the case of reloading, uh, thread safety is something that, that, that has to implement the, the, the web framework in, in, in this case. Okay? So Rails does that. Okay. So, um, there's metadata, and, and Zyberg knows what it has to, all the constant that, that has to be unloaded, and all the requires that have to be modified from loaded features in order to have reloading working on the next request.
And when you undefine a hotel, yes. hotel pricing also gets undefined automatically. Or how do you um, know the nesting? Well, technically, technically. Sorry for all the questions. No, no. <laughs> I could be working about this topic. I could be talking about this topic uh, up to the dinner, you know? So I'm totally happy with this. Okay, question. let's skip yes. all the talk. Uh, <laughs> so, technically, no. Technically, no, in the sense that the pricing constant is stored in the class object that was stored in hotel. So if you remove the hotel constant, what you get is you get an unreachable constant. You, so you are not going to get to pricing using the, the, using the constant syntax. But if you had the hotel class object still somehow in, an, in a variable or in another place, which is, which is something that you do not do in Rails. So these are the constraints. So we put constraints in the problem to, be, to have the problem solvable. Okay? That's why we put the constraints. With the, with the constraints, the problem can be solved. Without them, everything is too much generic and decoupled. So it, can, it cannot be solved, or at least I do not know any, any, a, a way to solve it without more, with, without more APIs. Okay. So, uh, if you store it in an arbitrary project, the hotel class object that was stored in the hotel constant, you can remove the hotel constant, but you have the object. So this guy has constants inside still. They are not reachable, but they are still there. But in a regular project, you do not hold the class object somewhere else. For instance, there is one gocha, which is people in the initializers storing class objects that they autoload. This is, this is going to be forbidden. No, we, we, we have a warning. We unload that thing. So in initializers, yeah. if you autoload something and store it globally, that's, that's one way to store the class object in two places, and that place is not going to be reloaded or anything. It doesn't work. So that so. means that when you assign a constant to a variable, that, yes. that breaks the uh, reloading, basically. Uh, if you, if you unless it, it doesn't. It doesn't if the variable is local. You can, in a method, you can do that, OK? But if you store the class, for instance, you boot the application, and the init, in the initializers, you get like a global variable, for instance. I've seen that in projects. Like, for instance, payment gateway. So dollar, payment gateway, this constant or this constant, depending on the, on the, on the uh, mode, OK? No, you are holding something in a global, in a global uh, place. And that's not, that, that's not going to work correctly because you're going to have a stale object. You believe you reload it, but there's some, the old object is still alive somewhere. So, but we warn about that in Rails 6. And eventually, unless we find a different solution to that, like executing initializers again on boot or something like that, is going to be forbidden in the sense that it won't, it won't boot. If you autoload something in the initializers, it won't boot. The next and the last question, but please be very, very fast. Well, I guess my question will be not that long. Uh, so uh, I actually wanted to ask about the loading times. So like comparing to the regular lo loading and the light work, what would be more efficient, and especially in terms of smaller apps and larger apps? Um, so. Um, I would say that in a Rails application, they are more or less the same because classic mode does nothing. Does nothing. Classic mode just installs a constant missing and it's lazy. If you if a constant is missing, then you uh, call it and, and and then you walk. Okay. Zyber mode walks a little bit less, a little bit less, and Zyber has been super, super optimized. For instance, it, it, does, it does work the application three lazily. So it does only one level at a time. You do one level. If you need more, then it goes for more. But it, it is not going to work the entire application three. It goes as, as, as uh, shallow in, as, uh, it, it is as shallow as possible. It only uses absolute paths. Everything has been thought to be performant because what, that, was, that was one of the goals. This kind of, this kind of libraries are like inf infrastructure. It's, it's not your, the logic of your gem. So it has to be super, super, extremely cheap to have it, uh, to, to have it there. Okay? It solves a problem, but it has to be super, super efficient. 
as much as possible. OK. Um, so uh, classic mode does, does nothing. Uh, but it works a little bit more. OK? So in driver mode, uh, when, when you set up, at, at least it has to, to go through the first layer. OK? Um, so that's, the, the timings are a little bit different. But in generally speaking, they are kind of similar in, one, in, in regard to performance in Rails applications. Because in, in GEMS, you, you cannot do that. It, there's no, it is not available, all right? Um, it has to be said that Shopify has it in production, for instance, OK? And they were like early adopters of, of Zyberg. And thanks to them, indeed, Zyberg is better. Because it was, it was tested in a, huge shop, in, a, in a huge application with thousands and thousands of files, hundreds of root directories. In a typical Rails application, you have like maybe a dozen. I don't know. They had like a lot of root directories, because they have a lot of engines and stuff. Okay? So that helped it, uh, identify things that, at that scale, uh, didn't, uh, didn't work as well as we wanted. Unfortunately, they did this before releasing Rails 6. So, I, so we were on time, and Zyberg was like super, super young. There, there were no, no one using it, or maybe Nano C, a few people. So we were on time. And thanks to that collaboration, uh, we, we could just go for full speed, uh, very small memory footprint. And yeah, and Shopify is working, is working greatly. Okay, thank you, Xavier.